so so what really frustrates me when somebody says they got 45 46 last time and what have they got to do this time to pass there's a couple of things to say really there first of all you know there's no disgrace in failing this paper the, you know the pass rate is roughly 50 percent so half the people pass and half the people don't and that you know 47 ouch laura you know what i'd like to think is the fact you got 47 is a good thing because it's better that you got 47 than you got 37 or 27 you know you've got a base on which you can build and the trick for me is to try and do something different this time than you did last time to try and get those few extra marks it's really frustrating that the exam that you sat isn't released to you 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 don't get your script back you don't know what what you've done right and what you've done wrong so you just know that you did an exam and you know you got 47. So one of the things I'll be talking about later is my mock exam marking service where you get to do a mock exam. You get to do an exam on the ACCA practice platform and you get that opportunity of me marking it and not just giving you a mark, but giving you a, a justification, praising you for the good things that you've done and you need to repeat and highlighting those things that you could do better. And it, it, it's done on the ACCA practice platform. It's a really good thing to do. Now, yeah, I've got another direct question there. What should we be doing in the time remaining? Let me deal with that at the end. But th there's, a, there's a particular slide um, on that. Um, you know, we are now in the middle of August. We've got two to three weeks left for the exam. And so our minds really, really, really should be on revision rather than learning, but I'll talk about that um, in a bit more detail as we as we start the session. Now, I'm not gonna formally start the session um, until the hour, or it's just gone the hour. I can see a few people are still arriving. Um, so let me just give it 30 more seconds uh, before I make a sort of formal gentle start. The session is being recorded and everybody will be sent a copy of the recording. Um, so check your email tomorrow. Won't be first thing tomorrow, but check your email. And by this time tomorrow, you should have been sent an email from me. Um, and if it's not there, just double check your junk, you know, and it'll be a link. I, I, I won't clog up your, your box too much. So we've got 59 people, 60 people, 61, a few more people arriving, people cutting it fine, coming home from work. Where is everybody? I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Scotland. I'm technically I'm on holiday, but my wife is very patient and good. And I'm here to help students. So I'm in Scotland. I'm in Nairn in Scotland. So Nottingham. London, Watford, hey, yeah, there's my local team, Watford, we well, we won at the weekend. Hello from Ireland, Fahad from India, fantastic. Ah, Greece, Georgia, wow, we have an international audience. Brilliant, Cyprus, Barbados, Rochelle, lovely. Thank you for logging in today. Thank you for logging in today. And uh, ah, Malaysia, oh, how I, how oh, I miss the warmth, how oh, I miss the food. But look, I am going to make a start. I am going to make a start. And you can see there on the screen um, that this session is probably going to last a bit less than an hour. Uh, there's a Q&A session at the end. Um, and I'm going to talk about mocks. And I'm going to give you a practical demonstration of the ACCA practice platform. So the first thing is just a very introduction briefly introduce myself. My name is Tom, Tom Clendon. And in my 20s, whilst I was working, I did the ACCA exams, did them in night class, did them in evening class, juggled that work and professional exam pressure. And I qualified whilst I was working with KPMG. But I quickly realized that actually, you know, doing insolvency, doing audit was not my passion. And my passion was more in terms of teaching 
And therefore, I got involved in working for a small company, um, Emil Wolf, and then we became Financial Training, FTC, and then we became Kaplan. And so I spent a number of years there running the London office, Borough High Street, ACCA courses, and teaching always on the final accounting paper. But I left them eight years ago and went to live in Singapore. And when I came back from Singapore uh, four years ago, three years ago, I wanted to do something different. So I started this online malarkey and I've hooked up with FME Learn Online and I'm very active on um, LinkedIn, as I'm sure most of you know. And life has come a little bit full circle because one of the other things that I do is also I work very closely with ACCA, supporting them, doing train the trainer webinars for their SBR tutors, marking programs, various things that I do behind the scenes and sometimes in the front of the scene. So I'm pleased to be able to put something back and to, to understand where the ACCA is coming from. And I've recently started a podcast. So that's something which also interests me and is a way of sharing some of my knowledge uh, with the student population. So that's a little bit about me. And I'm a little bit curious about you. And I'm a little bit curious about where you are in terms of your journey. And, you know, we've got 80 odd people here attending live. And I'm curious to know, yeah, which statement fits you best? Are you someone who's coming to SBR and it's kind of the first time? Or are you somebody who's already passed SBL or has already passed one of the optional papers? And I can see that most of you have voted, but I'm just going to give you a few more uh, moments. Those of you who haven't yet uh, decided, there's no right or wrong answer, is there? This is just a little bit of a warm up fun. Um, so, yeah, click away on the poll and I'm going to close the poll in five seconds. Five, three, two, one. So, yes, a recording will be made available and will be sent out to you. So let me show you the results of that poll. Three quarters of you are coming to SBR for the first time. And that, you know, that's that, that three quarters of you are coming to it as your first strategic professional exam. And that's that informs what I do, that SBR is the gateway paper to the strategic professional. I think it's a good thing to do first. You might also want to think about doing the EPSM along the way, but it means that we do need to be very familiar with the practice platform because the strategic professional practice platform is slightly different to the skills one. Um, and there's 24% of you who've already done um, an exam paper at this level, already succeeded an exam paper at this level, which is which is a good thing. But let's think about uh, how you've uh, how you've prepared, how you've got this far in terms of your SBR studies. And I'm curious to know as to whether you're sort of flying solo, whether you're relying on sort of free resources and books or whether you've actually committed and signed up with a tuition provider, whether that's BPP, whether that's Kaplan, whether that's First Intuition, whether that's uh, accountancy, whether that's with me, perhaps FME, I'm curious to know. And I can see that you're voting away using the, the poll on your screen. And as I say, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not right or wrong, I'm just a little bit curious. And what I can see, is that those of you who have voted, and over 80% of you have now voted, um, what I can see is that actually most of you are signed up with a tuition provider, and that's fantastic. That means you're committed. You've committed money. You've committed time to studying. And, and if you're self-studying, this is a great resource for you that I'm giving you here today. Um, well, I think it's a great resource for everybody. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but you do increase your chances of passing if you're signed up with a tuition provider. But I know in some 
instances, it can be expensive, but online is a great way of, of, of getting those resources. So yeah, that's, that's just the way we are. That's just the way we are. And I've got a third and final poll to uh, just to see, and these all polls are anonymous, you know, they're not going anywhere. This is just curiosity. Um, I'm just wondering whether you're an SBR virgin um, or whether you've been around the block um, or whether you're a voyeur and that you're just uh, uh, attending for uh, curiosity. Um, so we've got 83 people attending so far. And I'm curious to see, and I think virtually everybody has replied. And it's interesting. Well, that, that is interesting. The vast majority of you, 63% of you, are going to be doing SBR as your first attempt. Yeah? Now, there are a number of people here who are resits. And I talked very briefly about that at the beginning, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But you've put a lot of effort in to get this far. You don't quite know what's ahead of you. Yeah, it's tough. And your best, you know, you, 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 you know, <laughs> your first attempt. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. That's great. We're going to get you through. That's the idea. So look. That's a little bit of introduction. That's a little bit of fun and games. That's a little bit about me and that's a little bit about you. Now there's some cliches that I wanna trot out here because if you fail to prepare, then you are preparing to fail. Oh, Elaine, oh, Elaine, 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 sister. That is painful. And if, if I ruled the world, I would not allow 49%. I would not, I would, I would abolish the number 49. Yeah, it just wouldn't exist. Um, but it does exist. You did get it. You've hopefully put that anger, pain, frustration behind you. And we're now redetermined. Never get it remarked. There is no remarking service. 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 There's a review service, there's an admin review service, but it's not a remarking service whatsoever. So don't waste your money. Anyway, that, that boat has sailed. Right, how are we going to talk about this? I'm, I'm here partly to talk about the CBE platform and the practice platform, partly to talk about SBR in order to help you pass. And although I'll talk about, I'll talk about the practice platform, um, and I'll show you the practice platform. It's a little bit like riding a bicycle. It's a little bit like learning to swim. You've got to do it for yourself. It's a kinesthetic skill. And there are some functions on the CBE platform that you can use to your advantage, the editing, to make your presentation better. So we're going to use those to our advantage. And we are not going to stress around spelling mistakes. This exam is not an English grammar exam at all. This exam is testing our technical ability and our ability to communicate, not to spell. So we shouldn't worry about spelling. I certainly don't worry about spelling. Now, before I dive into the practice platform, I do want to briefly have an advert break. And here I am, I'm going to be telling you that I'm doing, that I've written a mock exam that's on the ACCA practice platform, that's there available for my students to do. And you can be one of my students, you can sign up for this course and you get to do a timed exam on the ACCA practice platform. It's an original one. So if you're a resitter, I guarantee you won't have seen these questions before. They're fresh questions, they're exam standard questions. And when you've done it, I debrief it, I debrief it. You get copies of me going through those answers, showing you where the easy marks, showing you how the answer is built up. You don't just get a typed answer. You, get, you don't just get the cake, you don't get the recipe. You, you are able to watch and ha see how the whole thing is put together. You'll get some last minute tips, WhatsApp support, as well. 
So it's a fantastic thing. Now, registration for this is about to close. So if you are going to think about signing up for this, please do so before Friday, because there's an onboarding process that I need to um, engage in. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more about this. But actually, in a strange way, um, perhaps it's me who shouldn't be doing the talking. Perhaps it should be one of my former students who tells you a little bit more about it. It really shows you the areas of struggle with, your weakness. I think the thing that stood out to me the most or that was the most useful for me was the mock exam. So we got to write a mock exam in the same platform as the real exam on the time condition. And after the exam, we got very detailed personal feedback. And that was very useful for me because it really shows you the areas of struggle with, your weakness areas. And then obviously, if you know your weakness areas, then you could improve on those areas. I decided to step the mock exam um, and it was um, really, really good because it was on an actual ACCA plat practice platform platform and um, uh, the questions even the layout and everything was very very similar to the actual exam so that helped me a lot because when I sat uh, the mock exam I sat under the exam conditions so it was a good test for myself uh, and of course then Tom's feedback uh, was I think absolutely amazing and I think that's what's helped me the most because I found out where I went wrong, um, I found out where I was right um, and where I could get uh, more marks, you know, those last minute easy marks that you can get. All right, that's from my YouTube channel. Uh, let's have a new screen share. Um, oh. oh, excuse me, excuse me. So the question uh, that popped up there, um, oh, hang on, let me just <laughs> Stop the other. Excuse me. Bear with. Get rid of him. So the deadline for the deadline for registering for the mock is this weekend. is is Friday. Um, I need to um, I need to get you registered with ACCA and for our systems to be compatible. Um, so I need to process you. There's also some pre work to be done before the mock exam, and then the mock exam is available for you to do at any time over a three day period. And when you start the mock exam. You then have three, you have a timed session to do it, but you can choose to do that anytime on the Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the last weekend in August. If you haven't finished revision, you're making excuses. No one is fully prepared to do the mock. No one is fully prepared to do the exam. You can only benefit by doing the mock. It is simply an excuse to say that within 10 days time, in, you know, in eight days time, you're not going to be ready. All right. So, you know, if 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 you're determined, you will find a way. Yeah. Um, you will benefit from doing the mock, Jermaine. Yeah, J uh, Jahan, you will. But I don't particularly want to continue all the sales pitch about the mock. Clearly, it's simply a fact that if you are able and afford to do the mock examination, you will materially benefit from doing so and increase your chances of passing. So that is the advert. Yeah, that's the advert over. Let me crack on with um, trying to add some value to everybody, whether you're going to do my mock or not. 
Um, and what I want to do, therefore, is to log on to the ACCA practice platform and to have a look at a past examination question and to try and show you my thought processes in respect of answering the question. So I've got a new um, share that I'm going to be doing and we're going to go uh, into Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's not what we want to have. We want to have a new share. And that's the new share that we want. So we should be now looking at the ACCA practice platform. And when I go in as a tutor, I'm going in uh, and I'm using my candidate account. It looks slightly different for me because I'm set up with um, set up with these processes as a as a marker uh, as a tutor and the one I'm going to have a look at is the most recent exam um, that has been released and you know I'm going to be looking at question two of this exam so this is something that some of you will be familiar with oh, no it's the wrong one sorry my mistake So looking at the March, June 21 exam, and I'm just going to be ignoring momentarily the questions. I can come back and have a look at the uh, your questions later, um, but I'm just going to be concentrating on going through. And the question I want to have a look at is this question of bismuth. All right. So it's question two in the exam. And one of the things that one of the reasons why some students fail is because they spend too much time on question one. They run out of time. And it is a good idea to do your best question first. And for some people, it might be question two that they do first. And that's OK by me. Now, whenever you're looking at, a, at, at, a, at an exam question, this is the this is the format that you are looking at. And I know that three quarters of you are new to the strategic professional exams. And you've got a choice of response options. Now, this is a question that some of you are familiar with, but perhaps some of you aren't. So I'm gonna deal with it relatively slowly. What we've got here is an opening set of information, which is worth reading once and worth reading quickly. Bismuth, mining company, exhibits, impairment, class A, blockchain, requirements, response. Yeah, you don't want to spend too much time reading it. It's simply setting out the information. Now you've got three exhibits here, but the first thing I'm going to do is to open up the requirements. And as I open up the requirements, I'm not going to read them. I'm not going to read them. Life is too short to read the requirement. That's right. I'm not even reading the requirement because what I'm doing is I'm going to open up my answer sheet, my word response area, I'm going to control C, control V, and I'm going to be looking at, yeah, creating a safe space for my answer. And this is what I would do as a student. This is what I would do in, in the exam. Now, I'm reading now part A, suitable calculations, should they recognize an impairment loss for the mine? Five marks. And I've got an exhibit over here. Part B, discuss whether the class A and class B shares should be classified. Well, hang on a minute. Life is too short here. I can only deal with one thing at a time. Let me deal with A. And A deals with the impairment. So I'm not, I'm not finishing reading the whole question. I'm just cracking on with it. Discuss with suitable calculations whether Bismarck should recognize an impairment loss for the mine. Bismuth owns mines. They have a carrying value of 200. A carrying value of 200. So we can highlight they've got a carrying value. But there's a decommissioning. There's a decommissioning issue. Yeah. And at the end of their lives, they've already created a provision of 53. I can see we've got there. Yeah, both an asset and a corresponding liability. 
the directors are unsure how the decommissioning provision will impact on the impairment testing. They are unsure how the decommissioning provision will impact on the impairment testing. So they need some guidance on that. And then we've got some numbers. 53 is the carrying value of the decommissioning. 20 is what we can sell it for at the end. 203 is the revenue that's coming in. And then we've got some uh, further operating costs. And I need to write an answer. If I've got five marks, then the amount of time that I've got for that is only eight minutes. Now, the requirement of the question is whether we should recognize an impairment loss. So I know the definition of an impairment loss, and I'm going to give that definition out. So Bismarck will have to write down the asset if it's carrying value exceeds the recoverable amount. The loss will be charged to PL. So instead of just giving the full definition, I've softened it slightly by referring to Bismarck. Now I'm I've made a deliberate decision to start with the words rather than the numbers. Because when you look at a five mark question like this, there are three marks I think that are going to be there for the words and only two for the numbers. So the words are always more important. And that's why I'm starting. And a good way to start an answer is with a definition. But if I'm talking about impairment, I'm having to talk about the carrying value and I'm having to talk about the recoverable amount. So let's leave a space and talk about the carrying value. Let's talk about the carrying value. Now I've got here 200. I've got the asset at 200. But equally, there's a liability there that's attached to it. So this is yeah, what I've got to explain. The carrying value of the mine is 200, but there is also a linked liability that is the decommissioning. The two are a cash generating unit and must be considered together. Now that's quite a technical point, but what we're saying is that you can't just test the mine, you've got the existence of the liability there. And then we need to talk about the recoverable amount. So the recoverable amount in this case, is the value in use. This is an estimate of the present value of the future cash flows based on reasonable assumptions. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm picking up on the language, uh, the, 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 the three marks. And so because there are three marks, I'm trying to say three separate things, yeah? You know, this is the requirement that doesn't earn me any marks, but this is about the definition and this is about the application. And I'm now gonna get involved in some numbers. And one way of getting involved with some simple numbers is to make a, a simple little, um, table and you can see there that you know I've messed up put the table in the wrong place that's okay just go back do the reverse yeah and then put the table in here where I want the table to be yeah and so it's okay for a couple of marks to do a table to do some numbers in the middle of the word processing so we're looking at the carrying value and what we've got with the carrying value is the asset now, the asset itself was 200. And then the carrying value, we've also got the liability. And the liability we have as 53. Now, do you need a calculator? 
<laughs> if you need a calculator, you've got a calculator here. I, don't, I, just, I just don't need a calculator. Um, you can have one in your hand if you want to anyway, but the carrying value is 147. We are then going to compare this with the recoverable amount, and we've got some cash that's coming in. So let's have a look at the numbers we've got coming in. Uh, the present value of cash inflows from the sale of the reusable items is 20. We need cash coming in from the sale of the mining output, which is 203. Yeah, so that is cash, which also comes in. I now need a couple of extra lines. So let me just right click there, row, um, insert row after, just make the table a little bit bigger. I've got some cash going out and the cash that goes out is operating costs, which is 48. And I've got some cash, which is also going out because if you're going to include the liability in the carrying value, you need to include the, the decommissioning and the liability. So you, I suppose you could have missed them out on both cases. Now, this is where it's worth a calculator, I think. Yeah, this is where it's worth a calculator, I think. Um, don't like the fancy calculator, so I always like a simple calculator. So what have we got here? We've got 20, yeah, plus 203, minus 48, minus 53, equals. So we've got there a figure of one, two, two, and therefore we've got an impairment loss of 25. Now, it's now half past six. I've run out of time. This is only eight minutes. I've run out of time. There's, there's, there's no more that I, that I want to do in this answer. And the fact that I now find myself um, deleting these columns and, and making a little bit neater is, is naughty of me. Because this answer, this answer, yeah, is five out of five. This answer is technically correct. And this answer has been produced within the time allowed. The examiner's answer is better. I know the examiner's answer is better. It's more fulsome. But you can't produce that I can't produce that level of detail in the time allowed. So this is as good as it gets, yeah? Complete with spelling mistakes, but it's laid out neatly. Now, some of you might be saying to yourself, but he should have used the um, word, he should have used the um, spreadsheet option. And if you wanna use the spreadsheet option, by all means, you can use the spreadsheet option. And you know you can you can drop the numbers in there, and you can see that um, I didn't bother using the the formula for the cells there, but I did. You know when it came to getting one, two, two, you can see the D five, D six, D seven, D eight. I've put the numbers in there, so you can use the spreadsheet functionality. So I'm just going to pause for a second and look back at. Um, uh, some of the um, questions that may have come in. Um, or or, or I'm, perhaps I'm, in, I'm now looking at the chat um, and I can see somebody's previously done a mock exam with Erin, uh, my colleague at FME for AA. Yes, you can, David. Yes, you can use a physical calculator. You're able to take a physical calculator into the exam. Can you use abbreviations? Um, you've got to be very careful with abbreviations because um, you will notice that in my answer, um, I said cash generating unit because uh, if I use CGU, it, it's jargon because I'm, I'm trying to explain and to explain in those abbreviated terms. Um, but you saw that in the narrative, in the computation to put in out you know, it's, it, you've got to keep it simple. You've got to keep moving. Will you get five marks for the answer you provided? Yes, 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 yes. You will get five marks for the answer I provided. 
because I've provided it within eight minutes. I don't know whether you are noticing the time that I spent on it, but I spent eight minutes on that. And I have done three marks. I've said three things. I've said what an impairment loss is. I've explained the carrying value and I've explained the recoverable amount. Absolutely. When you're struggling to decide how much um, having it, yes, if I had used the uh, spreadsheet, then I would also have to write into my word processing a cross reference to the spreadsheet. Absolutely, that would be appropriate. But in my first answer, I used the table, therefore I didn't have to do that. When you are struggling to decide how long to spend on the answer, Mihul, the idea is you should be governed by the number of marks that it's worth. So you allocate your time and you allocate your effort to the number of marks available. If it's five marks, it's eight minutes. If it's one mark, you're making one good sentence. You're making one short, sharp point. And of course you practice past exam questions. And of course, if you can, you come and do my mock because that means you're going to get the feedback. You're going to get additional resources. You're going to get WhatsApp support. Yeah, you're going to get some other tips and so on and so forth. You practice the past exam questions on the ACCA practice platform. So look, you know, that's, that's me as a party trick, if you like, um, looking at the answer to uh, the first part of the question. But what I'd like to do, there's no half marks. There's no half marks. Numbers are either odd or even. It's a binary world we live in. They're either odd or even. You either get one. No one gets 49 and a half. No one gets 49 and a half. Half marks don't exist. So as a marker, I had to either give you a mark or I don't. And I would give this five out of five. It's not. It could be better. But if it was better, it would take too much time. If it takes too much time, you're destroying yourself. If you don't provide the calculation, you get three out of two. Yeah, because there are two marks for the calculation. Uh, my mock exam, I'll talk more about my mock exam at the end. Hang on. I've talked about that already. I've given the price detail of that already. I'll come back to that later. What I would like to do now is hide the chat and do the second part of the question. Um, so again, you can see the mixture of technical input and me um, applying myself to the question. So I'm not going to be looking at your um, chat for now. I'm going to be looking at the second part of the question. So I'm scrolling down. And what I've got now here is financial instruments. All right. So what is the question is to discuss whether the class A and the class B shares should be classified as either equity or debt. Five marks. Again, five marks. What we're thinking about there is eight minutes. And if I'm looking at the time, it is for me 1837. So this should be taking me through to 1845. And what I need to do is open up this information here and read it and make some decisions and make to think about it. So discuss whether the A shares or the B shares should be classified as either equity or liability. Now, if I'm cynical, one will be debt. One will be equity, if I'm cynical. And I'm going to start with a definition. Yeah. So I will plan my answer so that I have a definition to start with. Then I can talk about the class A and then I can talk about the class B. I'm not going to bother using the scratch pad for this. The scratch pad is a waste of time. Bismuth has issued two classes of shares, A and B in exchange, oh, what the hell is cryptocurrency? What is going on? Bitcoin. Both of these shares permit the holder to vote and give an entitlement to rewards. What is rewards? What is that? What are rewards? Bismuth has discretion over whether the rewards are payable. So Bismuth has a discretion over whether the rewards are payable. That to me sounds like Dividends, that to me sounds like equity. 
that you can decide how much dividend that you pay. Bitcoin can be readily convertible into cash. Have you ever been to a magician where they say, look at here, look at here, look at here, and then something's happening down here. It's a distractor. This cryptocurrency stuff is a distractor. Class A shares can be redeemable at par if they get a listing and the listing is highly probable. So we have a highly probable listing. And on the listing, they can either get back the Bitcoin, which we know is cash. Yeah, whatever. Right. I think I've, I've, I've kind of got enough. I am getting a headache. So let me start with the definition. And I want to use the name of the company first. So Bismouth will classify the financial instruments it has issued in accordance with their substance. Debt instruments contain obligations to pay back cash or other financial assets. Bitcoin, what do I know about Bitcoin? Not a lot, but Bitcoin is readily convertible. So counts as cash. So Bitcoin is readily convertible. So counts as cash. Equity is evidence of evidence is evidence of ownership in the residual assets after debts are paid. So there's a bit of kind of definition going on there. Yeah. And, you know, I need to make sure that I apply. Now, these shares have rewards. Yeah. So I need to show some application. These shares have rewards. These are like dividends. They are variable. So this implies equity. Yeah. However, what's happening is that there seems to be, it's highly probable that the shares are going to be listed. And on listing, they're going to be redeemed. However, it is highly probable, the, it's highly probable Bismuth, Bismuth will list. And therefore, there will be an obligation to redeem these shares. For that reason, A is debt. Now, that means B is going to be equity. <laughs> because I'm just long in the tooth and cynical. Um, what do I know about B? Not a lot. Bismuth is not compelled to redeem the B class shares. I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? Bismuth is not compelled to redeem the B class shares. And, and if you want to be a little bit cheeky, control C. And we might just be able to drop that in. By doing control V, and this means that it is equity. This means that it is equity. This means that it is equity. Yeah, I mean, that's my sort of rather jumping to it cynical conclusion. Um, there is an option which allows us to repurchase them, but we don't have to. If we don't exercise that call option, 
then we pay additional rewards. So that's, that's not, you know, you know, if the call option is not exercised, then all that happens is extra dividends and not a redemption of the instrument. I suppose it would be slightly better to have the conclusion as the last thing, and therefore I could just tidy up my answer like that. It is now end of the show. Yeah, it is now the end of the show. That is my answer that I have produced live under time pressure. Yeah, and once again, I'm awarding myself five out of five. If I wanted to take a copy of this answer and send it to my tutor for marking, it would be very easy to do so because I've got the function there, the word processor. You, can you see that function, that little thing there? If I print on, if that says print, and then I could save it as a PDF, this would be my answer, save as a PDF, I'd then have it on my system and I could send it to my marker for marking, you know? Um, so look, there we are. There we are, what do you think? Um, Elizabeth, thank you. It's what I try and do to make it as straightforward as possible. It's not easy. I spend a lot of time and effort trying to make it look at easy. It is achievable. That's the point. Um, I didn't understand that question. Um, I don't understand. Is it better to write definition and highlight it? I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. I've done what I've done. Yeah. I mean, it, when I do it another time, I'll, I'll write slightly different words, but I'll structure it um, in a way. Um, I'll structure it in a way, you know, my spelling is incorrect, but the words there and, you know, you can play around with it a little bit, but, you know, that's the thought process. That's the thought process. And, and what you'll see me do is, is, is break down questions like this. Where are the marks to be had? So look, I'm going to move away from the um, screen share, go back to um, go back to where we were in terms of, you know, um, going through the formal presentation. Um, will it be okay if I don't delete the questions from my answers? Yes, fine. I mean, the fact that you've put the requirement in your answer sheet is there for you to help you understand the requirement. So you've got the requirement. It, it means you've got one less window open. There is massive time pressure, asthma. And that's why we need to do question practice. That's why we need to do question practice. It's massive time pressure. Uh, Eric says, what's the right order of doing the questions? You're an adult. You decide. There are four questions. But just because question one is called question one doesn't mean to say you have to do it first. You should do your best question first. What you can't afford to do is to spend five, 10 minutes reading all four questions before you decide. Life is too short. They're all compulsory. Just get on with it, all right? Because it's, time is so tight. Is it necessary to write knowledge proportion first and then apply to the scenario? I'm not sure I like the word necessary. That is certainly my recommended style so that you start with some kind of definition, if possible, which is in your head and gives you a, a, a something to write down. But it's all about the application. The majority of the marks are always going to be from using the information in the scenario. Ramiz, reading technical articles? Yes, please read them. Um, right, let me move on. Yeah, let me move on. 
um, I will be talking a little bit about current issues in a minute. You saw what I did in terms of exam technique. I read the requirement, yeah? Then I didn't read all of the exhibits. You, you, the questions, it's, you're not really doing four questions. That question two was three questions. You've got to think of the exam not as four questions, but as a series of breaking down points. And I don't mind whether you do question two first and question three second and question four third. And I don't mind the order. But if you're doing a question, do part A first and then part B second and then part C third, because sometimes there is a little bit of a flow through. Yes, is the answer, Adriana, to that question. Yes. That's on my mock exam course, you'll, you'll see some little bit of extra information about how you deal with COVID. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, when information is given, it's normally given for a reason. Yes, Wafa, yes. If you are told, who's going to be quickest? If you are told, who's going to be quickest? Which accounting, what's the accounting issue? If you're told the asset was damaged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roseanne. Yeah. Thank you, Hina. Yeah. Impairment. Impairment. Can you think of any other accounting standards? When I'm teaching, I will use impairment. I will use impairment in lectures other than um, other than when I'm talking about impairment and when I'm talking about other topics. What else will I talk about? When will I talk about impairment? If an asset was damaged. How can we spin on that? Yeah, I'm not that bothered about PPE. Not really thinking about that. Mm, no, it doesn't really relate to provisions, does it? Mm, you, well, yeah, maybe event after the reporting date. You've done cash flow? You know cash flow? When you're doing cash flow, you add back depreciation in the indirect method. So you would add back an impairment loss. It's not a cash flow. So I don't know, if you were struggling and you wanted something extra to say, if an asset is in damage, there's an impairment loss, you could bring in the fact of the fact that it's not a cash flow and it has to be added back. I'm not interested in provisions. IFRS 5, yeah. IFRS 5, hell for sale, I get that. What about deferred tax? If you have an impairment loss, does that create a deferred tax asset? or a deferred tax liability. If you have an impairment loss that causes a difference between the carrying value of your asset and the tax base, it means the carrying value of your asset is getting smaller, but the tax man ignores the impairment loss, so the tax base remains high, so you therefore have a, oh, I love it, you are good at this, you therefore have a deductible temporary difference and a deferred tax asset. So you could be talking about, you know, what are the accounting implications of recording an impairment loss? It's not only that you've got an expense in the PL, but you haven't got a cash flow. So you're reconciling it back in the cash flow statement and you're creating a deferred tax asset. So it's interesting to try and sometimes look at things holistically. How many accounting, what accounting standards spring to mind? Maybe you saw my recent LinkedIn post on this. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Wakas. Beautiful. Related party. Absolutely. Yeah, because if the director has taken out a loan and the company has guaranteed that loan, then that is a transaction between the company and the director. And, and the, 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 that is a related party transaction, even if, yeah, no money has changed hands. Eric raises provisions. I think you would, yes, I like the fact that Eric has raised provisions. And I think I, yes, uh, Chitarita, you are correct. I think it's a contingent liability because unless the director is probably going to default, 
you wouldn't be recognizing a liability under ISA 37 because ISA 37, asthma, 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 what kind of person are you? Sister, of course the sister, of course I'm close, I've got four sisters, of course they're close family, of course they're close family. What are we trying to do? Are related parties for a sister considered close family? Yes, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, don't start asking me to do genealogical tests, don't start asking me to talk about half brothers and half sisters, use your judgment. Use your judgment. Yeah, the standard deliberately doesn't specify, doesn't give a family tree. It says close members of the family. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, related parties, not everyone other than shareholders. No, go back and look at the standard because actually substantial shareholders are related parties. I'm not going to deal with that. That's too big to deal with. So it's, it, it's a contingent liability for disclosure. But if you're really on the ball, because the company signed a guarantee, that is in itself a financial instrument, because that's a financial instrument, that then they are recognized at fair value. And you would therefore be recognizing a liability at the fair value of that guarantee. If you want a further explanation of that, then go onto my YouTube channel and you'll hear me give a 10 minute explanation. So you can find my YouTube channel where I do explain that in a bit more detail. When the question says the following accounting treatment has been proposed, I almost guarantee that the treatment that is proposed is wrong because you just don't get answers which say the accounting treatment proposed in the question is perfect i've got nothing more to add they've done everything right there's no unethical behavior everybody is good everybody is competent and therefore that's not the way the game is played is it if you're given a situation either they don't know what to do or whatever they've done probably needs unpicking and explaining why. So don't be frightened of disagreeing with um, what's going on. And then if you're disagreeing with what's going on, thank you, Farhead. Thank you, Harriet. If you're disagreeing with what's going on, then you're raising two ethical issues. If, if you think the director is just an idiot, just made a mistake, because they're stupid, then that's competence. And you link it directly to competence. You say, if it's question two, absolutely, you say directly competence. Making a, a mistake shows unethical behavior because one of the pillars of ethical behavior is competence. And you say that and you'll get a mark, you'll get a professional mark. Now, if there's a clue in the question, that they're worried about profits, they're worried about bonuses. If there's a clue in the question that they're, they're trying to hit a profit target or something, then maybe the mistake is deliberate. If it's deliberate, you're dealing with self-interest, conflict of interest, lack of objectivity, you're dealing with integrity. If it's a deliberate mistake, it's a much more serious breach of ethical conduct. So say, spell it out. It may well be that this error has been made deliberately to boost the profits because the director is greedy, self-interest, and wants the bonus, wants to secure the job, whatever it is. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah? You explain why. You justify the right approach. Yeah? You can't just say it's the wrong treatment. You've got to say why it's the wrong treatment. Um, somewhere in the exam will always be a reference to from a shareholder's perspective and, and shareholders are interested in profit they're interested in share price I mean payment loss reduces the profit if you reduce the profit there is a correlation with the share price 
being skeptical. Oh, thank you. Yes, I like that. Like being skeptical. Yeah. Shareholders interested in dividends. Now, to pay a dividend, you need profit and you need cash. So put yourselves in the shoes and look at the transaction. How is this affecting profit? How is it affecting share price? How is it affecting dividends? Shareholders are pretty selfish, pretty short term. Or are they? Because there may be an issue around sustainability. Now, if you want a tip, if you want a tip, sustainability, look out. I've been asked to do a podcast on sustainability. Look out at the weekend. Look on my LinkedIn feed. Look on my podcast. I will do a free podcast on sustainability. It is a hot topic. Why companies are interested in reporting on sustainability, what their Pro, what their um, what their um, form of a sustainability report should take. It's been examined in the past. I had a meeting with the examiner recently. He made it absolutely clear it's going to be examined again. It's a clear current issue, along with COVID. Yeah, the 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 impact of uh, environmental concerns, the impact of sustainability, corporate. So it's a big issue, guys. It's a big issue, ladies. Yeah, it's a big issue. And, and, and it links in with integrated reporting. Absolutely, it links in with integrated reporting. Why do students fail the exam? And one reason is to do with their time management as much as their knowledge. And when you're in the exam, you've really got to be very aggressive at linking the amount of time that you spend on an answer with the number of marks. And you can't just do this for the first time in the exam. You've got to do a mock exam. Now, one option is to do a mock exam with me, which will be timed, which will be original, which will get marked, you will get feedback, you will get additional support, blah, 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 blah. blah. But if you can't afford that, or you decide that's not for you and you're registered with a tuition provider, you spank them. You make, you make sure that you do it and you make sure that you get feedback and not just a mark. Just being told you got it right or wrong is not the purpose of doing a mock. The purpose of doing a mock and getting it marked is for you to be able to digest that feedback so you can improve. How can you do better? That's the idea. This is my favorite slide. Say what you see. Someone is trying to fit the question into the answer. Never ever. You, you are not going to be able to rote learn something, go into the exam, dump it down. The question is always going to be original. You can't take your answer and make it fit the question. It, it's just not possible. You have to come up with an original answer. Well, you should do mine for a starter, Maniac. Maniac, yeah? You should do mine for a starter. More the merrier, I say. Plan your answer, please. Plan your answer. You saw one of the things I did with the with with the um, you know the definition, the class A, the class B. I broke it down. I had the plan. It wasn't done on the scratch pad. You can incorporate that straight away. And once you've identified the issue, you're softening that definition. Application, application, application. Conclude. Yes, everybody who has signed up for this will be sent a copy of the recording within 24 hours. Check your email. Yeah, you will get a copy of the recording within 24 hours. Edit your answer, but don't spend too long editing your answer. Time management is key. Leave space. Use it. Think about one mark per point. Time management is key. I could have given you a better answer. 
both questions that I did, I could have given you a better answer, but it would have taken me longer. And you need to have your exam marked out of 95, 96. If you have your exam marked out of 75, you're going to fail. If you're going to do three questions out of four, you're going to fail. The trick to passing this exam is being able to write something about a weak topic, to know something about everything. Yeah? You, you, look, I may have been a bit cocky and said, oh, that's worth five out of five. Maybe in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more aggressive way, once you've got four out of five, once you think you've done, there's, there's little point in spending too much time trying to get the fifth mark. If you don't know what um, cryptocurrencies are and you don't want to account for them, just ignore them. You, you know, you would have perhaps got four out of five for that answer if you just totally ignore cryptocurrency. You've got to move on. The best revision tip is to do my mock exam, my friend. <laughs> you ask the question, you set it up. Right. Time out here for a second. We've just done the question of bismuth. And in that question, I was arrogant enough to award myself five out of five for my answer. Here's a different answer. Someone's got it slightly wrong or it's slightly incomplete. You are the judge. Out of five, how many marks would you give? How many marks would you give this answer? Wackas would give three. Annie would give one. Laura would give two. I'm glad no one's giving five. And I'm glad no one's giving zero. Wackash or four. No, 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 no. It's not worth four. No, it's not worth four. It's not worth five. It's not worth four. It's not, not worth zero. Let's have a look at the numbers on the left. The numbers are wrong because they've missed out the 53, linking it with the asset. Oh, it's, it's definitely worth some marks. You can't give it zero. No, you can't give it zero. For the, for the numbers, I would give a mark because we've got there an impairment structure, a carrying value, a recoverable amount. I think someone spent too long on that table because they've um, put all the long words in there, wasted their time. And technically, the first sentence is fine. This is worth, I, in my opinion, two marks. Yeah, I would give this two marks. But more importantly, I would say there's a lack of application and that more needs to be written. My feedback to this student would be, you know, the numbers are, OK, but but actually what you need to do is to say what the recoverable amount is. You could have got a third mark if you'd said the recoverable amount was an estimate of these future cash flows that, you know, whatever. And, and, and it's, it, it's a fail. This is not quite good enough. Two marks. Right, let's do another exercise. Have a read. Three paragraphs. Business mine is impaired when the carrying value exceeds the recovery amount. So I've said that's worth a mark. Three paragraphs. Hegel says three, Waka says three. Five, Anne, ooh, Anne. No, it's not worth five, where are the numbers? Where are the numbers? Can't be worth five. Eric, it's three. Four. 
my um, my sister's a granny. Um, so her grandchildren live around the corner from me. And um, Louis is just learning to speak. And he can basically, he can say two things. He can say, my name is Louis. And he can say, I am two years old. All right, that's basically what he can say. So I said to him the other day, how old are you? And he said, my name is Louis. <laughs> now, what he said was true, but he wasn't answering the question, was he? He wasn't answering the question. The provision for decommissioning the line is a liability, establishing all three conditions. Of, uh, that is not about the impairment. That is not about the cash generating unit. It is technically correct, but it's a brain dump. One mark for the first paragraph, I get. Short one, technically correct, on the money, you applied, uses the word bismuth. Second one, no marks. Third one, no marks. It, it, it's all very clever. It's all technically correct. But the feedback here is where are the numbers? And you've got to show application. This is one mark. I'm being harsh. You've got to apply. This is one mark only. Yeah? If you think you're going to go into the exam and write a load of technical stuff down and pass, it, it, it's more than that. You've got to tailor it. Answer the question, not just give and dump information. Five points have been made here. Five points have been made here. This is the question we were looking at earlier. about the classification of the class A shares and the class B shares. The darkest hour is before the dawn, Mahadin. The darkest hour, not too late. How many marks out of five? Michael says nil. Good, I'm glad no one's giving five. I'm glad no one's giving five. One or two. Yeah, I think you're getting the, the getting the drift. I mean, when I look at this answer, the accounting for cryptocurrencies is a current issue. The value can go up or down. True, but bitcoins can be accounted for as inventory, but they're normally intangibles. True, but. It's important to get the classification correct. Sort of, yes, true, but. And although they, if I was generous, I'd give it a mark. You know, if this was a 48 or 49 script, I'd give it a mark and just kind of push them through. It, it, it's, it's hovering between naught and one. It's a po very poor answer because it's not applied. The feedback here is you've got to apply, you've got to justify the conclusion. It should be treated as debt and it should be treated as equity. Maybe the right conclusion, but it's a guess. It's a guess. You get the marks for the application. There's no definition given. One mark if I'm in a generous mood. If it's a mock exam, I give you a mark for encouragement. If I'm in the real, if I'm a real marker in the real exam, I give you zero because it's like, hey, come on, you should do, you should know better than this. Application. 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 We're training you to give judgment and advice in real situations, not to be Google. 
If a client wants to know the definition, they can look it up in Google. This is not an exam which requires you to have a massive recall and memory dump. You've got to understand, and you've got to apply, and you've got to use time management. Application, application, application. No oranges there, no bananas there. I talk to students, I listen to students, I advise students. Somebody was asking earlier, oh, haven't finished revision, too early to do a mock, or oh, I need to learn a bit more. And what happens when you're learning? You're a sponge. And you're soaking in the information, and you're soaking in the information, and you're soaking in the information. But in the exam, what are you doing? In the exam, you're finding a way of getting the knowledge out. That's what you've got to do in the exam, get the information out. And that takes a skill and that takes a practice. So Elaine, Elaine, wisdom, wisdom. You've got to do question practice. And one way of doing question practice, I am, I am going to repeat myself, but one way of doing question practice is to do my mock exam because it will be to time. You will get feedback. You'll get told what you did right. You get told what you did wrong. So there's a bit of a sales pitch going on here. Use the anxiety, Havan, that you feel. Turn it into motivation to be constructive. Turn it, you, reflect on the experience. Reflect on the fear of failure because there should be no failure. There should be no fear about failing a mock exam. It's a learning experience. It's an opportunity. Yeah. So it's about trying to be calm, trying to put things into perspective. We're not doing surgery. You know, we're not launching, we're not pi airline pilots. The cost of failure is high. I appreciate there's exchange differences around the world, but this is a world-class product that I'm offering you that's going to make a difference, going to add some value. Correct, Elaine. Correct, Elaine. I couldn't have put it better. Repeating the exam is also expensive. So there is my WhatsApp number. 07725350793. That puts you in direct contact with me. I have here my mobile phone. I can, I can feel it vibrating as we speak. Details of my podcast. You can easily find my podcast if you go on any of the, um, you know, Spotify or Google Podcasts, Apple. It's all there. And that's a free resource. And I talk about COVID there in, in one of those. And I will put something out on sustainability over the weekend. And I talk about my, um, if we fail, you, you haven't, how can you talk about failing my mock with 30% when you haven't even done it? Yeah? Come to me. Don't talk to me about failing a mock that you haven't even sat. So you're wasting energy, wasting energy. Uh, no, there won't be another session tomorrow. This is a one-off. This is uh, me trying to give a little bit of a um, something back, but also having an advert in the middle. You'll forgive me for that. Um, the number, uh, the WhatsApp number, well, is 0725350793. Yeah. You're WhatsApping me from outside the UK. It's plus four four seven seven two five three five zero oh, seven nine three. Yeah. So there's the number. Thank you. I'm glad it's made you think about how to approach the exam. Um, I've got a few minutes left. 
Are there any? Uh, we've dealt with quite a few questions during the session. Thank you, Bethel. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's very kind of you to say so. Uh, when anybody takes the mark, will we usually? Yeah, you. I mark it. You get it back. It's a professional operation. Um, don't worry about that. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Deborah. That's kind. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, speak again soon, Liz. Fantastic. I'm glad you found the podcast helpful, Elaine, and today's session as well. That's kind of you to say so. Um, if you look at the podcast, I mean, I think it's about 25 different editions on the podcast. One of them does deal with COVID. Um, thank you for the kind comments about the podcasts. Get in touch. If you're going to do the mock exam, it's a question of doing it and signing up for it this week. All right. There's a closure date on it. And uh, enjoy. Good. I'm glad you have registered for the mock. Yep. Fantastic. Tips for September. Do the mock. Ha ha. Come on. It's a compulsory paper. Come on. Yeah. Listen to my podcasts. Follow me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Those are free resources that are out there. All right. God bless. Thank you. Take it easy.